Greetings, nerdlings. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking to you about mutations and then ending up with artificial selection. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, we're going to talk about genetic variation. Genetic variation and mutation play roles in natural selection. And natural selection, if you recall, is the main driving force or the main mechanism of evolution. A diverse gene pool is important for the survival of a species in a changing environment, meaning that we want a lot of genes contributed to that gene pool, not just a few traits to pick from. We want green eyes and brown eyes and blue eyes and gray eyes. We don't want just blue eyes or just green eyes or just brown eyes to pick from. We want a very diverse group of genes for our gene pool. An adaptation is a genetic variation that's favored by selection and it's manifested as the trait that provides the advantage to an organism in a particular environment. So for example, the picture you see of this cute polar bear down here is an example of adaptation. So the polar bear has very thick fur. He also has clear fur that reflect the light and make him appear white so he blends in with an environment. Aside from his fur, he's also going to have a thicker layer of fat to help protect him from the cold. Same thing you saw in a previous lecture when I talked about the variation in the hair versus the hair in the snow and the hair in the desert. Hair in the snow is going to have white hair, it's going to have smaller ears because it doesn't want to lose heat, it wants to conserve heat, whereas the hair that's found in the desert are going to have that long, long pointy ears because it's wanting to get rid of its heat, as well as its long legs and shorter fur coat. So in addition to natural selection, Chance and random events can influence the evolutionary process, especially for small populations. So think about this. There's a bunch of little bunny rabbits in a forest. We'll say there's 20 bunny rabbits in a forest. Fred over there is standing next to a tree that falls. And unfortunately, Fred meets his ultimate demise. <coughs> Poor Fred. So 19 rabbits are left. If Fred's genes got taken out of that gene pool, then that gene pool is actually going to get uh, smaller very quickly because it's only a small population of 20 rabbits to start with. So if Fred dies, he's going to be taking a lot of genes or a percentage of genes out of that gene pool. Now, same scenario, let's say that we have a population of 20 million rabbits now. Tree falls in the forest, knocks out some guy, we don't even know his name because there's 20 million of us, right? Who cares? Those tiny little bit of genes getting taken out of that gene pool isn't going to affect the population as a whole. It might affect the guy standing next to him though, because might be a little terrified that dude right next to him got hit by a tree. But other than that, there's not really going to be much of an effect on the population. So what are the sources of genetic variation? And how does variation in a population or a gene pool arise? Well, of course mutations occur. Gene duplication and chromosome fusion provide the raw material for evolution. And meiosis produces new recombinations of phenotypes upon which natural selection operates. So if you remember from freshman biology, meiosis is sexual reproduction. And the whole reason meiosis occurs is to produce genetic variations. We don't all want to look the same. We want genetic diversity. And that's the purpose of meiosis. And we need recombinations of phenotypes. Phenotypes, if you recall, are what something looks like. That's what's observed or the appearance. I always like to say phenophoto. You take a photo of something, all you see are that my eyes are green. You don't know if that's a recessive trait, if it's a heterozygous, dominant, something like that. There are many different contributions that occur for eye color. But all you're seeing is the phenotype that's come through. I might be big G, little G, or big G, big G. You don't know. So there are different types of mutation. Most of mutations are deleterious. The word deleterious, good SAT vocabulary word, is something that's harmful. It's not good. And as well as recessive. So obviously mutations occurring in somatic cells don't affect future generations. So what are somatic cells? If you recall, way back when, maybe a couple months ago, we talked about somatic cells when we went over genetics in freshman biology. Somatic cells are our body cells. So if I have a mutation in just one of my body cells,
that's not going to get passed on to my offspring. However, if I have a mutation in my gamete, which are my sex cells, that will get passed on to future generations. So there are two types of gametes. We have female and male gametes. The female gamete is going to be the egg or the ova, while the male gametes are going to be the sperm. And mutations can occur at either the gene level or the chromosomal level. So what are point mutations? Point mutations are a mutation that occurs at one nucleotide, and there are synonymous and non-synonymous types of point mutations. So those occur when one nucleotide is substituted for another. So for example, looking right here, we have GGA and GGG. If for some reason this A got turned into a G, that would be a point mutation, and we would call that a synonymous point mutation. Because even though this A right here got changed from an A to a G, it would still code for the same amino acid, which would be proline. So synonymous mutations are when even though a mutation occurs, that code is still going to code for the amino acid. So right here it tells you that synonyms for the coding of amino acids, for example, DNA codons of GGA, GGG, GGT, GGC, all code for the same amino acid, proline. So whether or not this A got substituted with another G, it wouldn't cause a mutation in the protein. So the protein itself would be the same and it would function the same because the amino acid sequence would be the same. Sorry, it's a little windy here. I'm doing this from a Kaikoura in New Zealand and we have a little bit of a windstorm today. Um, again, that would be a synonymous or a silent mutation. So sometimes we call those silent because nothing happens. Now moving on to our next type of mutation, uh, our type of point mutation, we're going to talk about a non-synonymous, meaning it's not going to be the same as the amino acid that it coded for originally. So point mutations do, that do not resolve in the different amino acids are called non-synonymous or missense mutations. Missense mutations can affect the protein in one of three ways. First of all, it can result in a protein that does not function as well as the original protein. And this is what happens most often. So if you think about one of the main proteins that we've talked about before, uh, an enzyme. Enzymes are used to catalyze or speed up reactions within our body, and they're responsible for catalyzing all of the metabolic processes that go on in our bodies. So if a mutation occurred to an enzyme that prevented it from being fully functional, it would slow down the reaction rates of our bodies and ultimately harm us. Uh, the second type of result could be a protein that functions better than the original one. This would be a good mutation, and that would be the start of an evolutionary advantage. So that would be one of the examples of a mutation being good, and that mutation would probably get passed on from one generation to the next. And number three, it can result in a protein that functions like the original protein, and this is usually because the R groups are similar. Both are either polar or both are either nonpolar. So let's talk about gene duplication for a minute. Genes can be duplicated, and occasionally the duplication moves a gene from one chromosome to another. And then each gene will accumulate different mutations, altering the protein that is subsequently synthesized. Synthesized means it's made. Myoglobin is a protein that binds with oxygen in the muscles. And this gene has been duplicated and modified many, many times, and it's given rise to the hemoglobin gene. And this is something we'll talk about in class. Neutral mutations. So neutral basically means nothing's going to happen, or it's naturally evolving proteins that gradually accumulate mutations while continuing to fold into stable structures. So they're still functional, and they're still folding into their stable structures. They're just naturally changing. This process of neutral evolution is an important mode of genetic change and forms the basis of the molecular clock. Cytochrome C is a small protein found on the mitochondrial membrane. And between mammals and reptiles, there are 15 different amino acids or mutations of the cytochrome C. So let's look at some of the changes in cytochrome C. 
So if you look above, this is a comparison in the ancestral cytochrome C of human cytochrome C. This gene has been highly conserved as it is a protein used in the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. Missense mutations occur more frequently in pseudo genes than in functional genes. So pseudo, the prefix pseudo means false. So we talked about pseudopodia last year and pseudopodia are false foot. So pseudo means false. So basically false genes are genes that are no longer relevant or functional anymore. So this is a cytochrome C comparison chart. A dash that the amino acid is what indicates is the same found in the position in the human molecule. All the vertebrate cytochromes, or the first four, start with the glycine, or GLY, amino acid. The Drosophila wheat yeast and cytochromes, they have several uh, amino acids that actually precede, meaning they come before that dash. So even though there's a dash right here at glycine, they actually start with something else. Whereas the human, the pig, the chicken, and the dogfish, which are all vertebrates, meaning they all contain a spine, start with the same amino acid, which is glycine. So that dash, like it says right here, indicates that the amino acid is the, the same one found at the position in the human molecule. So here's a hemoglobin comparison. This is a comparison between the differences in the amino acid sequence of human hemoglobin and different species. The last three species do not have a distinction between their alpha and their beta chains. This is an inverse relationship between the difference in amino acid sequence and how closely related organisms are to humans. So what all of that mumbo jumbo means is basically the more variations there are in the amino acid sequence, the less closely related it is to the human. So there's only one difference in a gorilla between a gorilla and a human. So we are more closely related to the gorilla than we would be to the dog where we have 15 differences. So this is a cladogram that you guys should be able to decipher. So if I asked you which one of these organisms is more closely related to a human, you should be able to look at this cladogram without the key down here at all and tell me that the lamprey is the least closely related to the human. If I asked you which one is the most closely related to the human, you should be able to look over here to the macaque and say that the macaque is the more closely related organism to the human based on this cladogram. The next type of mutation we're going to look at is called a frame shift mutation. And just like the name states, it's going to shift the entire sequence. So it occurs as a result of either an insertion, meaning a nucleotide is inserted into the sequence, or a deletion, meaning a nucleotide is removed from that sequence. And this changes the amino acid sequence of the protein from that point forward. So we have chromosomal rearrangement that can occur. There have also been major changes in chromosome structure that result within changes of populations which can in turn result in the emergence of a new species. So when chromosomes get rearranged, a new species can come out of it. These include inversions, deletions, duplication, translocation, and fusion. If there are any of these words that I just said right now that you don't know, this now would be a good time to look those up. So chromosomal rearrangement. If you compare the karyotype of a human, H, and a chimpanzee C, you're gonna notice that the great apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes, whereas humans only have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So why did that difference occur? Well, it's because chromosome number two in the human is actually a result of the fusion of the chimpanzee chromosome. And on the previous slide, remember we talked about new species emerging from fusions of chromosomes? Well, this is an example of how that occurred. So I'm going to talk about one thing before I end this podcast, and that's going to be artificial selection. Artificial selection is exactly what it sounds like. It's artificial or human caused. This is when humans actually manipulate a gene pool, and there are often consequences involved in such manipulations. Just to give you an idea of something that we've manipulated into looking and tasting like something completely different, 
would be the wild mustard that you see down here. So we've manipulated it into many different crops that we now grow and we consume. So cauliflower is a result of sterilizing the flowers that occur from this plant. Broccoli is a genetic uh, engineering project where we had to suppress the flower development, so we got broccoli. Cabbage was creating by suppressing the inner node link. Kale was achieved by enlarging the leaves of this plant. And the kohlrabi was the enhancement of lateral meristems. So antibiotics and artificial selection. This is something you see on the news a lot. You're hearing a lot more on the news about um, antibiotic resistant drugs and people dying from bacterial infections that they contract in hospitals. So antibiotic resistance. When antibiotics are applied to a population of microorganisms to treat an infection, some of those microorganisms may be naturally immune to the drug. So let's say we have 100 bacteria and I apply some type of antibiotic to it, all of them but one is killed. So 99% of those bacteria are killed, but one made it, so that one bacteria is going to be left to reproduce. So why does this happen? Well, a random mutation occurred in the genetic code of the microorganism conferring its resistance. And these resistant microorganisms continue to flourish, and those are going to what cause the disease. So I know all of you have had to take a STAR test. So one of the main practice questions that you'll see on a STAR exam is the Petri dish, and they tell you that various discs were soaked in different antibiotics and placed on the Petri dish, and the clear ring around them represents no grow layer. So that's what we're looking at, or that's what I'm talking about now, is that bacterial resistance. So a bacteria that is no longer affected by antibiotics. So the remaining option a physician will have if the person is resistant to a specific antibiotic, or I should say if the bacteria that the person has is resistant to a specific antibiotic, would be treating the infection with a different antibiotic and hoping that none of the surviving organisms go on to reproduce. So antibiotics and natural selection continued. There is an increase in the antibiotic resistant bacteria and it's starting to cause doctors to reduce the number of prescriptions written for antibiotics in general. So a lot of times people go to the doctor and when you go to the doctor you're paying money and you expect something in return. So unfortunately, a lot of people would go into the doctor and they would have a respiratory infection or they might have a fever or they might have some type of cold. Well, a lot of the infections that people go in with doctors are actually viral and not bacterial. And if you remember, viruses are not alive. So antibiotics, meaning anti-life, they're not going to kill a bacteria because they are, excuse me, they're not going to kill a virus because a virus was never alive to begin with. Those are used solely to treat bacteria. Bacteria are living, thus they can be killed. So about 70% of pathogenic bacteria are actually resistant to at least one antibiotic. And those are called superbugs, or MDR bacteria, multi-drug resistant. So one of the more popular infections that we've heard about is called MRSA, or the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. MDR bacteria do not respond to the first line of defense antibiotics. These types of bacteria are more commonly found in hospitals where people are already weakened by whatever condition brought them to the hospital to begin with. So people in hospitals are more likely susceptible to getting a methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus bacteria. So the MDR bacteria can attack internal organs upon gaining entry into the body it can cause really nasty skin boils and lesions, and a lot of times they don't heal. So basically the doctors are left with trying to treat that infection with a different antibiotic. I hope this podcast was helpful to you guys. I wanted to thank ilovebiology.net and the National Math and Science Institute. Stay nerdy until next time. This is the Queen Nerdling signing off.